so much. All right, praise God. You know, Sunday, or actually last, I think it was last Thursday, I started uh, ministering on preparing yourself for a new move. How many know that when you get a promotion, amen, that you have to, you have to be prepared for that promotion? And, and somebody sees uh, quality, amen, potential in you, and, and you got to learn that in that new promotion that there's going to be many new requirements. And so uh, not everybody, amen, is going to be is going to be happy about your promotion. Not everybody's going to, you know, be jumping up and down, but that's all right. Because somebody saw in you what others, amen, were refusing to see in you. And so as we get, uh, as we're making this new move in the body of Christ, nothing is new when it comes to Christ, amen. The Word of God says there's nothing new under the sun. I don't care what you think about today. It's already been done. It's already been thought about. Somebody on down through history, amen, had already had the same question or the same ideas. And so when we look at this, we ask this, well, how can something be new? It can be new to us because we're going to do something maybe we haven't done before. Uh, we're going to minister where we have ministered before. Amen. So it means in this right here, taking on new responsibilities. And so remember this right here, that when it comes down to authority, authority is delegated. And I've said this. You can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. Responsibility is on the individual. And so as we look at this right here, I'm going to take you, amen, in the Word of God to the uh, first uh, uh, epistle of uh, Paul. He is uh, in Timothy right here. So it will be 1 Timothy, amen, uh, chapter 1. And so we want to start right there. And uh, what we're going to do is build a... We're going to build a foundation on, amen, a promotion that I believe that God has, amen, not only for the body of Christ, but for right here at For Whosoever Will, and for you that are watching tonight. And first of all, I want to say for you that have joined with us, how honored we are to be able to come to you and to preach the valuable Word of God, and to be able to lift you up, amen, your needs, your, your uh, prayers, amen, situations that you're going through. We ask you to email us, uh, let us know, amen, what it is that uh, you're going through and how we can pray and stand with you. And so we'll be giving you that email address uh, later on in the service, amen. So we go to 1 Timothy, amen, and I'm going to start with uh, verse 15, amen. 1 Timothy Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. And we'll stop right there for a moment as we get in the Word of God. We find out that what he said was in verse 15. He said, we have to realize that every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have to realize that in all of this right here, that there's none of us that are perfect. Amen. The only perfect one is Jesus Christ. And so as we begin to realize this right here, we don't look at other people, amen, and think that they need to be perfect. And then when they do falter or fail, then we begin to attack them. We understand this right here. A man who lives in a glass house should be the last one to throw stones, amen? amen. And I've said this many times. And so what Paul is telling Timothy is, don't judge people, amen, don't judge people by what you see. Don't judge people, amen, because you heard this or heard that. What he's saying is, I am the chief of sinners. Now, Apostle Paul was saying, I have a, I have a past. Anybody here got a past, amen? amen? And in this past right here, he's saying that, listen, there was a lot that went on that I could be accused of. But he said, I'm already admitting that I am a chief of sinners. He said, but I obtain mercy. And how many know the Word of God says the mercies of God are new every morning? So every morning when I wake up, it's just like your bank account. Could you imagine just every morning when you wake up, somebody deposited $100,000 in your bank account? You would be like, hey. But then, understand this right here. It's not because that you are worthy of that $100,000. 
It's because somebody, amen, that knew your past, somebody that knew your failures said, I am forgiving you, but I'm going to bless you. Now, how many know that's a hard place to be, amen? And so you say, well, I got this blessing coming in, but I'm not worthy of it because of what I had done in my past. And so, but since I got saved, since Jesus Christ came into my life, now I have mercy. So I have to learn to be merciful to others. That's a hard place to be. When somebody hurts you, when something happens, it's very hard to show mercy. Mercy is not just saying, okay, I forgive you. Mercy is saying this right here. Not only do I forgive you, I'll never bring it up again. And what I will do is I will turn around and bless you, amen, as Christ has blessed me. That's a hard place to be. Because in the flesh, we want to retaliate. In the flesh, what we want to do is not get even. We get ahead. That's what, amen. Uh, we heard that uh, saying for so many years. I don't get even. I get ahead. Well, what happens is every time you get ahead, they get ahead. So pretty soon, amen, we, neither one of us got ahead, amen. We just get it chopped off, so to speak. And so the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy right here, if you're going to be a minister of the word, then you've got to understand this right here, that man in his own nature is fallen. Man in his own character is less, amen, than God's best. So we come into the place where I begin to judge myself before I judge somebody else. Amen? And so I cannot prepare for God to use me to minister to others until first I begin to realize, amen, what God has done for me and how I have to accept others. And so when we begin to look at this right here, he goes on and he says, I want you to hear this. He says uh, in verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me... He said, first, Jesus Christ might show uh, forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now we go to verse 17. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so I want to park right there for just a minute. What he's saying is we have to understand who God is. God is not just a word. God is not just, amen, we call him when we're in trouble. Something you go, oh my God. No, understand this right here. God, amen, we, when we look at this right here, God is eternal. And we look at him being eternal. He is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's everything in between. God is God, the creator of all, amen. And so as we look at this, he says, you have to understand that he is immortal. He's not mortal. He's immortal. That means this right here. God is supreme. God knows more than you do. Amen. He knows more than any of us. Why? Because God created everything. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. We find out that God spoke and said, let there be light and light appear. Not one of us can do that unless you're in a dark room. Turn on the light switch. Amen. And in that time, you can say, let there be light. And you hit the light switch, there's light. Amen. But understand this right here. God took what was nothing and turned it into something. We cannot do that. We can take something that's already been created and maybe turn it into something else. Amen. But we cannot take nothing and turn it into something. Why? Because God is the only one that can do that. And so as we look at the Word of God, we find out that once we begin to uh, honor Him with His character, we begin to honor Him with His being, what we are going to do is now that we're going to give Him glory. That means we're going to go ahead and praise Him for who He is, for what He has done. It means in this right here, we, we're going to cause, amen, we're going to cause Him to be high and lifted up, amen, in our praise. That means you can't make God high and lift it up yourself. But your praise and your worship can, uh, uh, amen, can extol and can bring him into that place that he's high and lifted up in your heart. We're not just saying, oh my God, this happened, or oh, oh my God, is that. What we're saying is, oh my God, is eternal. Oh my God, is majesty. Oh my God. And so we begin to, he's my healer. He's my character. He's my, you know, he's my counselor. He's my everything. And we begin to see him, amen, as personal. Many today do not see God as personal. They see God as far off. They see God as distant. And even though they pray, it feels like I'm praying to a distant God. 
where it should be that you feel like you're praying to a personal God. You, you feel like my prayer right now is effective communication, amen, with the Creator, and that's been purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. So when I begin to come into effective communication, watch this right here. What is effective communication? Effective communication is this right here. Identifying, amen, your problem and needing a solution and ready to accept what God is telling you. That means that I have effective communication. I'm not going to come in here and try to dazzle God, amen, with some kind of, you know, theology or whatever, doxology. No, I'm coming in here. What I'm saying is this right here. My communication is like I'm talking to him on my phone. Amen. And what I'm saying is, God, you already know, but I, you, you want me to say it. You want me to speak it out. So what I'm going to do is speak out, amen, what is my situation right now. But before I get into my situation, let me stop and praise you. Let me stop and worship you. Because praise and worship, amen, brings down the barriers of communication. Think about this. When you're into praise and worship, what it does is it brings your mind, amen, into another setting. That means now all of a sudden my mind now is to where I want to, I, I just want to be in the presence of His holiness. I want to be in the Holy of Holies. As the high priest used to go into the Holy of Holies, and they had to, they had to go through, amen, I call it a ritual, it's a cleansing. They had to go through all of this before they could go into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because if they didn't, amen, and they went in and they had any unconfessed sins or they had anything, God would strike them dead. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, when that veil was rent and tore in two, that means now we have access, amen, to the throne of God so that we can go in as a high priest. We can go in and make known, amen, that petition or that desire that we're bringing. But we do it in order. We do it in order. There are so few that really know how to pray. They really don't know how to pray. We think that prayer is just, okay, well, you know, Lord, uh, you know what I need and everything, and I'm just asking you to bless me, bless this, and, uh, you know, bless this mess, do all this right here, and, oh, God, I need, I need, and I need, I need. No, prayer, amen, it always starts with praise. When, when you start praising, amen, it changes the way you pray. Now, all of a sudden, you begin to pray mercy on those that have come against you. You begin to pray, amen, that your faith is going to be strengthened. You begin to pray that in my faith in, in Jesus Christ, amen, I'm not going to wander. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to stop. What I'm going to do is by faith, I'm taking another step. I may not be able to run, but I can take another step. You see, I, I, I try to bring this uh, picture out, is how do you climb a mountain one step at a time? And, and what happens if you get a fourth of the way up the mountain and you slip and fall and you, you slide all the way back down? You get hurt and, and you get banged up and you're like, oh man, I, you know, I, I'm not going to try this again. And so, but then you begin to look at that mountain and say, wait a minute, that mountain cannot conquer me. I'm going to conquer it. And so this time you start again, but you're more prepared. That means now you have the right climbing shoes on. You have, you have the right clothing, amen, for the weather that may uh, hit you up on the side of the mountain. Now you're more prepared. You know why? Because at first you were an amateur. But now you're going back and after being through extensive training and everything else and the right equipment and repelling and knowing how to get up there, amen, with the ice cleats on and you're saying, I can do this, but you get up to the summit and you're tired. You get up there and guess what? The altitude now, your breathing is not the same. You thought you were so prepared and you did. You made it, you made it uh, twice as far as you did the first time, but now you're going to have to come back down. You know why? Because your respiratory system is not, is not prepared, amen, to go up to a higher level. So they bring you back down. And this time, you've got to prepare it more. You've got to get out there. You've got to start exercising your lungs. You've got to get out there and start running. You want to start climbing. You want to get out there and make sure that this time when I go, wait a minute, I'm even more prepared because this time here, I'm going to take some oxygen with me. i got a canister on. So when I get to that altitude that I was at before and I'm having a hard time breathing, I'm going to go ahead and put that oxygen on. Now... I find out I can breathe better. Now all of a sudden I can go higher. 
And as I'm going higher, amen, I might, I might have some new obstacles. That, uh, they have some crevices or crevasses up there. That you, you say, wait a minute, how am I going to get across this right here? It's wider than I thought. I didn't even know they had them up there that deep. But yet, this, is, this thing may be 60, 80, 100 feet across. And you're looking, you're saying, man, I don't know how I'm going to get across this right here. And you're saying, I wasn't prepared for that. I don't, have the, I don't have the ice ladder that I can lay down and, and the proper cleats that I can walk across this and get to the other side. Nobody told me about that. i got to go back down the mountain because I reached my peak at that time. I wasn't prepared for that crevice. I wasn't prepared. And so I'm saying, i got to go back down. But wait a minute. I did come further than I had before. I still am in victory. You know why? Because I've gone where I've never been. I've achieved what I've never achieved. But yet there's more. Anybody see how this is in life? As all of a sudden we start out in life. And, and you know, we're ready for life. But then all of a sudden, what do we do? We hit that first obstacle. We say, I was prepared for that. You know, we hit that place where it says, listen, we gotta have we gotta have a job, we gotta have finances. Wait a minute, I was I, you know, I wasn't prepared for that. I told my kids as they were uh, growing up, I said, always be pre be prepared because when you get married, or even before that, when you get ready to go to college and, and you're out there, understand this right here. There is nothing free. Nothing free. And so when they went to college and they got there, they were like, wow, this is, man, this is wonderful. And how many know the first thing they think about? Come on, party on, dude, man. This is going to be, you know. Well, then they found out they weren't prepared. Why? Because they were used to staying up late. They were used to hanging out. And they were used to the, getting in those good uh, study skills, amen, and, and dedicating yourself to five, six hours of nothing but hitting the books and getting ready for those tests. And then all of a sudden, they, man, i got a test coming up. And if I don't pass this one right here, and now they got to cram and they're trying to get all this in and everything. I wasn't prepared for this. I was just coming thinking it was going to be a, just fun and games. But I found out that guess what? Now I have to be mature. I have to make decisions. Now what happens is those hard decisions, it may take me away from some friends. It may mean some that used to hang out with me don't want to hang out with me. You see where I'm going with this? Well, what happens is, let's bring it into the spiritual. Let's bring it in when you first get saved. We're so joyful, and we ought to be. We're happy. I just got saved, you know, and I feel, you know, I remember when I got saved, I just feel like a thousand, ten thousand pounds had fell off. I was so excited, but I was not prepared, amen, spiritually for the first attack. I was not prepared. I thought getting saved, everything was going to be just, I mean, it was just going to be smooth sailing. And, and you know, here I am saved and God's just going to bless me. And I don't have to worry about stress. I don't have to worry about all that. Because, you know, I'm going to church and everybody in church, you know, they're just wonderful people. And what happened to that? Mm -hmm. I found out when I got saved, the first thing that happened was I got attacked. I got attacked because now... Now you're one of those goody two-shoes. Now you're one of them Christians, okay? But before when I was out there, amen, clubbing, I was out there drinking, I was out there running, I was, I was okay with the world because they all thought, hey, man, this is cool. They love, you know, spending my money. But watch this. When I got saved, and then I began to not want to go to the clubs. I got to where I didn't want to go out there drinking. I got to the place where what happened was I felt uncomfortable with the world. And I felt more comfortable in the house of God. Mm -hmm. But then I found out that, listen, climbing in this mountain of self, that there was a lot that needed to be excavated. There was a lot that needed to be taken down. Because, you know, how many know this? You don't really have your spiritual eyes open until you get in the house of God. Yeah. Amen? Come on. And you think everybody in the house of God got saved. They all got wings. They're all uh, angels. And, and, and you know, everything's going to be uh, just great. But then you find out that, guess what? Their flesh is just like yours. <laughs> right. They have attitudes. 
You find out, you get in church, and guess what? There are ones that you put your trust and faith in, and then all of a sudden they fail you, and you're hurting, you're heartbroken, and all this. Right? And God says, don't put your trust in man. Put your trust in God. And so I begin to understand this. And so when it came to climbing that mountain, amen, the spiritual mountain I'm talking about, uh, and I'm flipping a little bit here between spiritual and the flesh. But understand this, when I got to the spiritual mountain, this is the same mountain, amen, that we look at that Abraham had to go up. This is the same place right here that puts a demand on your relationship with Christ. This is the same mountain right here that God's going to ask you for something that you're not willing to give up just to see if you really trust him. That's a hard place to be. That's a real hard place to be. But you know what? When you begin to obey, trust and obey for there's no other way. Amen. To be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. It seems real good. The song's out there. But when it comes to actually living it, that's a hard place to be. And so I remember this. There was a time that, you know, I had a pastor come to me and, and uh, I had I had just given my life back to the Lord. I had a time between when I got saved, amen, and when I dedicated, amen. And so when I had totally dedicated myself back to Christ, he came up to me and he said, listen, he said, I want you to become the bus driver for the church. I'm like, what? I had, you know, I had uh, driven, uh, you know, uh, Bluebird, I had, uh, you know, my, uh, in the military, I had driven uh, buses for the military and vehicles and stuff. And he says, I want you to drive this bus. Got a 72 passenger bus. And I said, do you have a route? He said, no. I said, has anybody driven this before? He says, no, I'm not even sure the bus runs. I'm like, really? Where did you get this? Somebody just gave it to us. So I said, Lord, I said, I said, Lord, here I am. I'm working two jobs, amen, and, and plus I'm farming, and I'm doing all this right here, and now they want me to drive a bus that don't run. So I said, Lord, I don't even want it. I don't want it. No, no, I don't want it. And God says, go fix a bus. How I many know a lot of times God won't even argue with you? He just says, argue. I've heard you now go fix a bus. I said, God, it's a diesel. I've never worked on diesel. I said, I'm strictly gasoline. I said, I've never worked on diesel. I didn't hear anything. So I went out there and I popped the big cover off. And I said, God, if you want this thing to run, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to show me. And how many would know that I looked down and there was a little broke wire? And I said, well, this little broke wire goes to that other broke wire. So if I put these, uh, I did a jumper and I went ahead and, uh, you know, put a wire nut on them and everything. And